um, I'd like to introduce the uh, final speaker, um, uh, Morris uh, Maduro, who's um, uh, the Director of uh, Molecular Cell and uh, Systems Biology at the University of California in Riverside. Uh, and uh, Morris is going to tell us about uh, his group's paper, the GATA factor ELT3 specifies endoderm in C. elegans angaria in an ancestral gene network. Over to you, Morris. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, can you hear me okay? Very good, yeah. Good, thank you very much. So what, um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, our evidence that a gene network that we've been studying for some 20 years, which looks like something like this, is actually a derived version of a much simpler ancestral network. And so we'll be looking uh, at development in uh, C. elegans. So the general uh, theme of what we're studying is gene regulatory networks. The simplest thing that you can imagine is a transcription factor activating the expression of another transcription factor. And we know that gene regulatory networks are important in many uh, contexts, including development, of course, um, rewiring dynamic changes to the environment. It's important in things like cancer progression and so on. But we also know that gene networks evolve over time. You can add new genes into the network, lose genes, uh, subfunctionalize duplicates of genes. And this type of rewiring uh, is certainly behind the changes in form and function that we see when we have differences uh, in related species. But this type of rewiring can also occur under conditions where the phenotype doesn't change in any obvious way, which has been termed developmental system drift or DSD, where the gene network behind the scenes is undergoing rewiring, but we don't have an obvious change in the phenotype. And so we're looking at this in the uh, C. elegans uh, and related species. Uh, they're very small, about a millimeter long when fully grown and easy to study. Their embryonic development, which looks something like this, uh, is uh, easy to see under the microscope uh, and consists of a series of holoblastic cleavages that generate asymmetric fates uh, apportioned to different cells. We're actually interested in this one here, which is called the E cell, which is the progenitor of the intestine. And the majority of embryogenesis takes place in only 14 hours at room temperature uh, and consists primarily of uh, morphogenesis after cell fate has happened to shape this thing uh, into a worm. And so these early uh, cell divisions set up the so-called founder cells uh, through a, a specific pattern of uh, asymmetric divisions. Uh, and the founder cell we're interested in is the founder cell E, which goes on to make the intestine. So uh, E's uh, origin is uh, takes place about the eight cell stage and it undergoes a specific set of uh, cell divisions to produce 20 cells that will become uh, the intestine or midgut. Uh, here's the appearance of uh, the gut primordium uh, when there are four descendants of the E cell and eight, 16, and 20 as it turns itself into a tube. And here's its appearance in a juvenile, uh, the L1 larva, where you can see the intestine or midgut here and it has these uh, sort of shiny birefringent gut granules that we can see under polarized light. So for some 20 some years, uh, we have and others have studied the gene network that causes E to be specified. And it turns out to be the result of a cascade of expression of structurally similar GATA factor proteins. So GATA factors are a type of transcription factor that consists of a zinc finger and associated basic domain that interact with sequences uh, that have GATA at their core. Vertebrate GATA factors uh, typically have two such uh, uh, zinc finger and basic domains or GATA domains, whereas the invertebrate ones typically have only one. And the way that this gene network uh, in C. elegans is known to function is that the activity of maternal genes, uh, particularly skin one, which encodes uh, an NRF-related BZIP homeodomain type factor, uh, initiates expression of a pair of zygotic regulators MED1-2 in the four cell stage that then go on to contribute to activating the specification of E in the E cell through the activation of N3 and one, and then these hand off uh, expression control to L2 and L7. L2 is sort of the main intestinal factor that kind of keeps intestinal uh, differentiation maintained for the lifespan of the animal, whereas these upstream factors are all transient. An additional maternal factor, the uh, TCF Wnt type effector POP1, is responsible for contributing regulatory input into specification as well. And so you have this <clears throat> deployment of a gene network in space and time that hands off transcriptional control to subsequent genes in the network. All of these genes are structurally related. They bind similar targets. However, they all have distinct 
phenotypes alone or in combination. And when you mutate one or more of them, you start to beat up the pathway. The strongest phenotype <clears throat> that is seen occurs after removal of two genes, AND1 and AND3 together, that are expressed in the early E lineage and are responsible for specifying E alone. And these two genes are within uh, tens of kilobase pairs of each other. They both encode GATA factors. And by way of example, when we mutate N1 and N3 together, you get a bunch of dead embryos. All of them lack uh, intestine, and many of them don't quite develop into something that looks like a worm. However, a small fraction of them do, in fact, develop into a larva that can hatch and go off into the world, although it promptly dies because it starves to death. And you can see that it's cleanly deleted for the intestine. It's actually surprising that so much morphogenesis can happen around the absence of an entire germ layer. And if we overexpress AND1 or AND3 in a normal embryo at around the time that the E cell is normally specified, we can re-specify all of the early embryonic cells into gut-like progenitors, producing uh, an embryo that is nothing essentially but a bunch of gut cells. And so that shows that end one and three together are uh, essential for gut to be specified, but either one of them can be expressed and that's sufficient to specify gut. Whereas end one and end three in the upstream factors are all sort of transiently involved in specification, L2 and seven are on for the lifespan of the animal after specification has occurred and their removal doesn't result in the absence of gut, but it results in dead larvae that have sort of gut morphogenesis and uh, function. However, you have patches of missing gut granules, the lumen has uh, defects, the gut doesn't function properly. And so it's thought that N13 can initiate sort of differentiation, but the maintenance of that differentiated state is lost when L2 and its partially redundant factor L7 are deleted. And so at its simplest, we can interpret this uh, cascade of regulators to be maternal factors, skin one and C. elegans being the most important one, upstream of med one two, which is important for both specifying the E cell and the sister cell of E called MS, and that these transiently expressed factors then lead to the initiation and then self-regulatory uh, positive uh, maintenance of expression of L27, which keeps um, the intestinal fate going. And that's really where our story begins. <clears throat> what we uh, discovered is that these genes, which are collected essential in C. elegans uh, are present only in species very closely related to C. elegans uh, in the genus uh, Cenorhabditis, the so-called elegans supergroup, where we find orthologs of the med, N3, N1, and L7 genes. And at the moment you step outside of this group, those genes, even in the same genus, are uh, completely absent from the genome, which uh, leads us to the question of, well, we can find skin one and pop one orthologs, but what is it that is specifying gut? The L2 gene is still found, uh, so it likely like, is responsible for maintaining the intestinal fate. However, the, the only other GATA factors, uh, classical GATA factors, that are conserved in all these other species are L1, L3, and L5, all of which have some uh, hypodermal character. The hypodermis is essentially the epidermal uh, germ layer, ectodermal germ layer. L1 is one of the two-finger GATA factors, and it is essential for specifying hypodermis fates. L3 appears to be a reinforcer of L1, although it has recently been shown to have function in stress responses in um, post-embryonic animals. And L5 is important for a subclass of epidermal cells called the seam cells. And so uh, there's no obvious candidate for what might be specifying gut. And so the first thing we did was to ask the question about what is it that the known factors orthologs might be doing outside the elegant supergroup. And to do these studies, uh, we settled on uh, the one species uh, outside the elegant supergroup that has been cultured in the laboratory, uh, and it can function uh, and grow just fine under similar culture conditions as C. elegans. It is male-female, unlike C. elegans, which has a hermaphroditic mode. In nature, uh, this species, Cenorhabditis angaria, has been found in phoretic association with an agricultural pest, the sugarcane weevil Metamasius hemipterus. And here they are uh, by structure truly am found sort of, uh, if you strip off the exoskeleton, you can see the uh, adults crawling around in there. And through a collaborator, Taisei Kikuchi at University of Tokyo and Simo Sun, uh, we obtained a high quality uh, genome sequence that allowed us to find orthologs of these genes. So the first thing we tried were the two upstream maternal factors. We could find clear orthologs of these genes in C. angaria. And when we performed RNA interference, found that POP1 is uh, making a positive contribution to gut specification, just as it is known to do in C. elegans and uh, C. briggsia, a related species that we've also studied, but much more closely related to C. elegans. 
However, the clear skin one ortholog uh, did not have a phenotype at all when it was knocked down, and even though we did controls to make sure that the messenger RNA was being uh, depleted, did not find any detectable phenotype suggesting that some other gene might be doing it or that it might be redundant with something else. And so it's an unknown whether or not the skin one ortholog, which is so important for specifying gut fate and C. elegans, uh, has any function at all in C. angaria. The next gene to look at is the only one that's left to, to compare, which is ELT2, the factor that comes on and stays on in the C. elegans intestine and keeps intestinal fate uh, maintained. When we looked at the expression of C. angaria or can l 2 using single molecule inexpensive fluorescent in situ hybridization, we can detect uh, messenger RNAs for l 2 starting when there are about two daughters of the E cell uh, and continuing on through in the at least the embryonic intestine. This is very similar to the expression pattern uh, of C. elegans or cell l 2 using a similar method in that species where we see it coming on after the time of gut specification and continuing through the intestine, at least in the embryo. Uh, and if we do RNA interference on L2, we find in Angaria that we get arrested larvae that have evidence of gut differentiation, but the animals die. And that's the same phenotype as when we remove uh, L2 and L7 in C. elegans. And so L2's role in differentiation and maintenance of differentiation is conserved in C. angaria. We took an uh, ELT2 uh, transgene, taking the genomic region containing C. angaria ELT2 with several kilobase pairs of upstream regulatory sequence, inserted the coding region for GFP, and brought this as a transgene into C. elegans to see how far the conservation of its uh, uh, expression goes. And what we found is that when this transgene is introduced into C. elegans, it expresses very similarly in the uh, intestine primordium and going through into at least the embryonic intestine, very similarly to the expression of of a reporter from the native uh, ELT2 gene in C. elegans. In adults, uh, we can actually see uh, subnuclear spots that uh, suggest to us that ELT2 uh, GFP from Angaria in the context of this transgene in C. elegans possibly autoregulates because these spots uh, that have been shown similarly for ELT2 GFP tag in C. elegans uh, are uh, thought to be representative of uh, autoregulation, where the GFP tag L2 can find the, trans, uh, the transgenic array that encodes it and interact with the promoter of that of the transgenes in that array. And so it looks like L2 really is the terminal uh, gut factor in C. angaria. And when brought into C. elegans, it can actually express in the intestine. The next question we asked is whether or not it can function as a gut differentiator. And if we remove L27 by mutation, uh, it can rescue, the presence of the C. angaria transgene can rescue uh, these, this phenotype to complete viability, showing that C. angaria L2 GFP transgene can functionally replace L2 and L7 in C. elegans. Uh, then a strange question occurred to us, which is, well, if L2 and L7 are not in C. are not present in this experiment, then what is actually activating L2 GFP? Is it responding to maternal factors in C. elegans or what? And we crossed this uh, transgenic reporter into a double mutant for end one and end three, which you'll recall from earlier disrupt uh, specification, and it completely abolished expression of the L2 GFP reporter in C. elegans. So somehow the C. angaria L2 GFP transgene uh, is expressed in C. elegans, but it's expressed downstream of N1 and N3, two transcription factors that don't even exist in C. angaria, leading us to ask the question, what is it that's actually activating L2 GFP uh, or L2 in C. angaria? And so we hypothesized that it was probably another GATA factor that was taking the place of N1 and N3 in C. elegans. There are only three of them, which are the um, hypodermal GATA factors, L1, L3, and L5, at least in C. elegans. And so we looked at them by expression, hypothesizing that if any one of these is the gut specifier in C. angaria, it ought to be present in the early E lineage. And uh, we found that L1 and L5 couldn't be it. They were expressed in the hypodermis later on, similar to their expression patterns in C. elegans. They were present in the early embryo, but not specifically localized to the E lineage, telling us that probably it was the only remaining one, which is, of course, C. angaria L3. So uh, C. angaria L3 is, in fact, activated at the same time and place as N1 and N3 in C. elegans would be, suggesting that it is the gut specifier in C. angaria.
Curiously, we get the later hypodermal expression of L3 as well. See, Elegans L3, we could not detect any expression in the early E lineage, and it had the later hypodermal expression consistent with prior work. We resolve this kind of strange paradox by finding that in C. angaria, there are two isoforms of L3 encoded, a short isoform and a longer one. Using SMI fish probe sets specific to the long isoform showed us that it is that isoform that is likely to be specific for intestinal specification, whereas we probably, uh, we hypothesize that the short isoform is what's going on um, and being expressed in the hypodermis. So the next question is to ask if this uh, gene is in fact the gut specifier by removing its function through RNA interference and through uh, a chromosomally, gen chromosomally generated mutation using CRISPR, we find that in fact L3 in C. angaria is completely essential for the endoderm to be specified and we get arrested larvae and embryos similar to the phenotype of removal of N1 and N3 together in C. elegans. In C. elegans, the removal of L3 has absolutely no detectable phenotype in endoderm or in any other tissue, although it's been shown uh, later on to be responsible for uh, changes in stress responses, suggesting it, it has that uh, later role in C. elegans, but not in gut specification. To do the complementary experiment to overexpression of N1 and N3, we found that consistent with our earlier findings, that if we overexpress the long isoform of C. angaria L3 or L3V in C. elegans, that is sufficient to respecify the endodermal fate. And this is actually done uh, in the background where we've replaced uh, the L27 genes with the C. angaria transgene. And so L3V uh, is sufficient to specify endoderm and C. elegans. We tried the experiment of taking the C. angaria network consisting of L3B and the CANL2 transgene to ask if that combination could replace the entire suite of endodermal genes, L7, N1, N3, and L2, that are expressed uh, in the intestine. This is a very uh, dead strain that cannot specify intestine, nor could it differentiate it if it could. Uh, and to drive the expression of uh, C. angaria L3 in the early E lineage, we used the promoter from the C. elegans N3 gene. And this combination of two transgenes is sufficient to rescue this quadruple mutant to complete viability uh, with not a perfect efficiency, but about 50% of transgenic animals are rescued at 25 degrees. And so this work, and I didn't have time to tell you that we uh, checked two other species, C. portoensis and C. monodelphus, uh, thought to be a stem species or a sister species to all of the other known species in the genus. And both portoensis and monodelphus have expression of an L3 ortholog in the early E lineage, suggesting that that is what's going on outside of the elegant supergroup. And our conclusion from this is that C. angaria uh, contains a simpler version of the gut specification network uh, that is what we call sort of the ancestral mode. That's the simplest explanation for why these species have an early L3 and how they might be specifying gut. And that somehow at the base of the elegant supergroup, a series of rewiring events had to take place in order to give us the much more convoluted network that we see today, uh, a concomitant with the loss of L3 in specification of gut. And we hypothesize from the expression that L3 short isoform maintains its function uh, as an accessory factor in the hypodermis or and in stress response. So one uh, sort of a hand wavy model for how you can take a simpler ancestral network and make it more complicated um, is probably by gene duplication, divergence, and intercalation of regulators farther upstream. Uh, but the problem is we have no intermediate species to look at. Uh, we can only hypothesize that perhaps L3 uh, obtained uh, was duplicated, and that duplicate uh, essentially took over the function of uh, the L3 gene. Its function was lost, and we had uh, another duplication event to make N1 and N3 together. We bring in skin one regulation, and then we intercalate another uh, pair of uh, GATA factors, these similar MED1-2 factors, um, in order to be sort of the zygotic effectors of SKIN1 to give us a, a version, a derived version of this ancestral network that we've studied so long um, in C. elegans. Um, I'm almost finished. The uh, next question, of course, is why this might have happened. 
Uh, we think there may have been some kind of a selection for increased robustness of the network, which often happens when there are increased uh, regulators found in networks, as is uh, known to happen in uh, species related to Drosophila, where additional regulators might be the drivers for increased robustness uh, for more rapid development. Um, and it may be that these specialized individual L3 paralogs, N3, N1, uh, and so on may uh, be more closely tied to things that need to be very tightly spatiotemporally controlled, such as the cell cycle. Uh, and perhaps that uh, more tight regulation of these extra factors might have allowed uh, um, uh, C. elegans and related species to conquer more, envir uh, more you know, environmental niches and so on. And so, um, in summary, we've told you about this gut factor network that specifies gut and C. elegans that we've studied for 20 years, but that it may actually be derived from a much simpler network that really is just one ancestral factor, a long isoform of uh, the related gut factor L3. Um, and so, this simple ancestral pathway seems to have undergone duplication and specialization of the factors in that pathway. Um, and we can take that minimal pathway from C. angaria and, and use it to replace the complicated pathway in C. In C. elegans, although it doesn't work um, as robustly. And I thank uh, all the contributors to our end and specification work over many years. Um, the most of the work for this study was done um, by my wife, Gina. Uh, and I thank also our collaborators, Taisei and Sima, who provided access to um, the very, very nice genome sequence for this species. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morris. Um, very nice, as uh, as with all of the talks that we've heard today. So we do have a few questions uh, in the question and answer sheet. Uh, and the first one is, um, can Angaria ELT3 be regulate uh, C. elegans ELT2? I think you showed it rescued endoderm. Is that through regulation of ELT2? Yes. So I didn't have a chance to talk about this experiment. We did take an N13 double mutant, actually N1 L N3 L7 triple mutant, and introduced um, an N3 promoter regulated C. angaria L3b, and it does rescue um, by activating L2 in C. elegans. And so and, that and top half of the network does yeah. work in C. elegans. I had a related question, which is, if, if you put the C. elegans L3 in the right time and place, will it also regulate uh, endoderm development. Yes. So, so yeah. we followed up this paper with a, a, a micro publication. In fact, if you there, there are two isoforms in C. elegans. They're, mm -hmm. they're both expressed. We don't know what the long isoform is doing in C. elegans, but when we take the long isoform of L3b from C. elegans and force it on in the early E lineage, it too can specify. And so it's maintained that functional ability. Curiously, others have studied the L3A short isoform. In fact, uh, when it was first identified as a gene, it was the only isoform known at the time. And so uh, those studies could only find um, a hypodermal function. And so it was a surprise, in fact, that C. elegans maintains this cryptic role for a long isoform of L3 because it doesn't seem to have that role at all in C. elegans. Okay, thanks. And so next question is, um, you mentioned uh, the idea of uh, robustness and uh, do you see any evidence that the network in Angaria is less robust, say more variability in timing of expression of the of the downstream regulators like L2? That is that is a terrific question. And um, because Sorry, we don't get so that's from Catherine. Catherine. Brown. Yes, it is a terrific question. And we do get um, we're able to you know specify in them, but it's not um, it's not as good when we bring that network into C. elegans. And we think that. Part of what happened in C. elegans is that the subfunctionalized, you know, derivatives of L3 probably picked up other functions in the cell cycle and so on. And when you replace that with one regulator, you kind of, there are some events that are sort of variable enough that you get not quite rescued embryos in some cases and in others. The, the experiment that we want to do is to, is to really stress C. angaria. One of the problems is that most of these experiments have done in laboratory isolates that have been inbred for at least several generations, and certainly if you propagate them long enough, it's surprising actually just how robust um, the strain is at all, because most of the, the species in the C. neuroditis genus are male-female, and if you propagate them long enough in the lab, they get very, very sick due to inbreeding depression. And so they become less robust 
us just propagating them in the lab. C. angaria um, is actually surprisingly a very healthy strain in the lab, even its inbred derivative PS1010, which we used, and we also studied a wild isolate RGD1. What we'd really like to do is have more wild isolates to examine this question um, more closely, because all we have are these inbred lab derivatives where robustness could already be compromised for any number of reasons. But that's, those strains grow well. Um, C. angari has only ever been isolated in Miami-Dade County, Florida, uh, on, on cut harvested sugar cane by Robin Giblin Davis. That's the only isolates known in the entire world. Um, I'm not sure if that's enough evidence that that maybe C. angaria can't conquer so many environmental niches, but um, we don't have any evidence of a, a lot of supreme variability in the timing of expression of, of L2 or of specification of gut in general. But the problem is because we have these inbred derivatives, we don't know that if we were to see such a thing, that it was simply not the result of, you know, death by a thousand cuts, homozygosity of a bunch of other polymorphisms in the genome that are leading to other defects in the cell cycle. So it's a question we'd love to ask, but sort of can't. Okay, thanks very much. The last question I'm going to struggle a little bit with. Uh, can you see it on the question and answers? I can there. It's, I, it says, can we, yeah, can we bring the C. elegans regulators into C. angaria? Um, almost certainly this will work because structurally we've shown the reverse experiment that you can put L3B from C. angaria and it works pretty good in C. elegans. I think that is part of the problem. It, it's almost certain to work. Um, but we haven't done that experiment because it's male, female, because um, it's a little bit harder to work with. Uh, it's an experiment that isn't so easily do. When, when one has worked for many years in C. elegans, it becomes um, difficult to work yeah. with a system like C. Uh, angaria, which is male, female, and not a lot of people are working on it. So very few genetic tools. Okay. Well, thank, thanks. We, we should wrap up. 